Ladies and gentlemen, on the uh, in the middle of January, which for some is a depressing time, we're welcoming you to the Regeneration Podcast. Let's remind people that the the days are getting longer, Michael. I have a good friend who is on the podcast, uh, Father Ed Dillon, and uh, he used to come into my office when we worked together. He's retired now, but he knows every day in his head that, for example, and I'm not going to get this right regarding today, that we gain you know, a minute in the afternoon, but we're still losing 30 seconds in the morning and things like that. And I asked him, I was driving him to an event last Saturday, and he was telling me what was going on for the next week down to the, the nanosecond. And I said, like, this is kind of weird, you know, that you're into it so much. And he said when he was over in Rome, that he just became obsessed with it, that why it's huh. not, why it's not um, even every day, right? Consistent on both sides, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's the wobbly nature of the earth and that, you know, it's, it's not equally, it's not an equal diameter at all spaces and things like that. But he did admit to becoming obsessed with it. So, you know, for many years, he just studied how many minutes we lose and gain. Um, but the uh, February is a great month because we're kind of gaining a lot. Really, March is the, the one where we gain the most. Yeah, but you really notice it, I think, right around Candlemas. Yeah. That's when, you know, you can really feel the difference. I, I mean, I, I'm definitely noticing, of course, I always wake up with the sun, yep. uh, which is in the summer, I wake up at 530. <laughs> and in the yeah. winter, around this time, I wake up about 730, quarter to eight. That's good for you. Yeah. Make but sure. uh, here, though, I don't know if it's the same there. I imagine it is. But I, my son in Colorado said it is. It's been so cloudy. Yeah. Well, this uh, Rochester, New York is known as one of the cloudiest in the country. We just get all the Great Lakes clouds, even if it's not yeah. raining all the time. Yeah, I'm in the Great Lakes and we are, we have the Great Lakes clouds. But it's been cloudier even than normal, mm -hmm. a typical winter. Do you get, a, does it, do you let it get you down or like what's your approach to that? No, um, but it does, <laughs> after a while you're like, when's the sun gonna come out? Okay. I think we've only seen the sun once or twice since Christmas. Yeah. Uh, even but I do take you know, in, in the winter. I take vitamin D three and magnesium. As do I, which seems to help. I don't take it during the summer because I'm outside all the time. But, uh -huh. but I do it do it during the winter. Yeah, well, again, we have our students even from Albany, not too far away, to a certain extent, Syracuse, New York, uh, just an hour and a half east, and they're shocked, shocked at the amount. Really? Of, yeah, the difference between sunshine. And I have a daughter in New York City. It's not sunny all the time there, but she. Um, and the abbot of the monastery where I worked, he finally admitted last year. Uh -huh. that, you know, it's uh, he's been here for a long time. It's just well, he's from India, right? Yes, he was born yeah. in a, a little sunnier in, there. Yeah, he was born in Qatar, and then but spent most of his childhood in Mumbai. Uh -huh. And uh, yes, yeah, so it's it's a it's a force to be reckoned with. So mm -hmm. um, and again, you said uh, Candlemas. Um, we'll talk about you know this guy Coventry Patmore maybe for a whole episode one time. Again, under under a deceptively. I think it's a name that's off-putting. We think we're just going to get, and he did write a poem, a famous poem about just domesticity, which can be a little bit saccharine. <laughs> but when, when he broke out, when he broke out, that guy was crazier than Manly Hopkins, Dante, and the most erotic love poets put together. Yeah, I, and, I published one of his poems in the first Jesus of Imagination, I think. Yeah, he's something else. And uh, he, he has a beautiful poem on Valentine's Day where he, he wonders, you know, why do we host this day about love in kind of the middle of winter? And different from... Candlemas, where we know maybe in the Steinarian worldview, the seeds start moving underground. Mm -hmm. He noticed the same thing around Valentine's Day, you know, that love's first bloom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's very close. Yep. So again, when we're not seeing the sun and when it's cold, there's other things we can be focusing our attention on that uh, you know, there's always movement. So, but today, speaking of movement. Before we go there. Good. Tell me. So I had a, you probably heard that Jeff Beck died this week. Yeah, it was real sad. I was too. And I think we should, let's have a little quiz for our listeners. Let's see if I can do it. I'll play a Jeff Beck lick and they have to guess. You, you, you can guess. And if you don't guess what song it is, we'll have our listeners. There it goes. Okay. okay. I should have gotten it from four notes. Is this name that tune? That was, huh. Can you name that tune, Mike? Give, me, give it to me one more time. I didn't hear it that time. That's not coming through, for listeners. Not did. coming through? No, the first one did. Okay, that one did. 
Again, if this was named that tune, I'd have to say like okay. five more notes or something. Um, and okay, we'll have to wait for somebody else. This is great. So we'll see, listeners, what was the number one? Now here's number two. Okay. Now that's somebody who we're only getting every third note, but that almost sounds like Lou. You're only getting every third note? I, I, I think so. I think our listeners would. Okay, okay I, I could turn it up. Try it again. Let me turn it up. <laughs> it's going up to 11. Looks like Michael's standing up. Maybe he's going to bring over a. All right, let's happens. try this again. Ready? All right, I'm ready. Is that better? Yeah, definitely. What's wrong with me? You can't get that one either? No, I think, you know, my friends from college are going to listen to this and mock me out. We were in a, we were in a garage band. And we kind of patterned ourselves on Beck, Bogert, and uh, a piece. Okay. Yeah, and I was okay. Tim Bogert. I was the bassist, yeah. Now, here's the last one. Now, I hope I remember how to play this. I haven't played it in a long time. People are... You got it. Yeah, okay. Fine. And he played for so many different bands. You know, I might be listening for the Yardbirds, have my mind clued in and be, you know. Yeah, I was not... going to try a Yardbirds tune, but I've been a while since I played them. Yeah. Yes. All right, you you're ready. Is that one. Yep. In fact, I just got, I, so when Jeff Beck died, I posted a few Jeff Beck videos on, on Facebook and uh, Twitter. And one of my friends from, I when I was 19 or 20, her ex-husband was a very good friend of mine. And uh, she said, oh, and I posted, people get ready. And she said, okay, Mike, now you have me bawling. <laughs> because it's a beautiful song. I mean, it's a it gospel is. song that he did with Rod Stewart in yeah. about 1985 or so, which is beautiful. Yeah, I saw a beautiful Our, picture of him and Clapton on, uh, again, people are posting a lot, a lot, and justifiably so. Yeah. Yeah. What were the, uh, well, again, what were, we have people listening of different ages, name the other bands he played with i mean he had played with so many different people he did and uh and actually my my uncle dearly departed uncle who was more of an older brother to me uh he we he would teach me a lot of guitar licks because he was i think 11 years older than i am mm -hmm. so he would teach me all these guitar licks and he taught me how to play with the thimble like jeff beck play yeah. slide with the thimble so that was kind of cool yeah well, again, rest in peace, Jeff Beck. Mad love out to you and uh, all the people mourning his loss. Hey, right? Well, I have to go yell at my kids. Okay, do it. I will. Um, hey. I'll start introducing our topic as Mike is yelling at his kids. All so far, all I heard was, hey, that doesn't sound too hardcore. Um, maybe they weren't doing too much wrong. They couldn't have been doing too much wrong, Mike, because all you said was, hey. Okay, I yelled at him. Okay. Did I think somebody's here to pick up milk. That's what they're yelling about. Okay. Uh, so here's the dealio. Um, I'll kind of set the stage with a, a little story from my first year in grad school studying theology. I was, um, uh, you know, I was kind of lost in life. My mom pointed out a, sm a small local grad school, and I always probably had an interest. I don't know why I went. I guess I was interested in the God question, but I do believe it was my first semester, and I was taking a course called Making. It was, it was moral theology, but a book we were studying was called Making Moral Decisions. I'm still, it's still out there. don't remember the author. But, uh, you know, this seemed to me to be a, a book that would be about like life on life's terms. And yet it, it seemed to posit that every time you had to make a moral decision, you had to do this complex analysis. So it was a spokes and wheel model, you know, and when you had to make a moral decision, you had to consult like scripture, hierarchy, authority, tradition, humor, and about five other spokes on a wheel. And it just kind of bored me. And, um, and I, don't, I, I wish I could say better why. I, you know, I, another hero of mine I've mentioned, Stephen mm -hmm. you know, he 
he said like in a chaotic world, moral decisions are the only rational ones, right? That mostly evil done in the world is done with like overthinking causality. So to think of the Vietnam War, you know, people thought that Vietnam went communist, the whole of Southeast Asia would go communist. So it was causality. Right. And then, so we, we just bombed the shit, you know, out of a whole a country. Anyhow, uh, the footnote to this page that kind of arrested me with its boredom, depression, something, uh, at the bottom, it said, of course, there's these people, um, and it implied that they were probably lunatics, but who believe in anti-consequentialism. And uh, there was a name associated with it. It was totally new to me. It was like reading um, gibberish, but mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it ended up being Nicholas Berjayev. And okay. uh, so it was a three-hour class. We had about a 20-minute break in the interim. And again, it was my first semester, and I walked to the library, and I just grabbed two books by him. I rushed up the stacks. And this was a great theological library. I just grabbed two. One was slavery and freedom. One was solitude yeah. society. And I came back and for the rest of that class, I started, you know, just reading under the desk. And I think that's how I went to all of grad school and uh, certainly changed my life. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing I remember about him was that he just wrote with such passion, right? There was no detachment. And so mm -hmm. today we're going to talk about you and I, and we're going to introduce people to a topic that'll come back in various ways, but I'm going to call it, uh, and you give it whatever you name you want to, Michael. I'm going to say uh, an introduction to the Silver Age theologians, like another time when giants walked the earth in the church. It really um, was. Yep. Talk about your and how did you first discover the first of them? So I think it happened with me. Uh, I was working at this bookstore and uh, one of the customers, I Get, you know, chat chat them up all the time. I'm talking to this guy, and I told them that I had gone back to praying the Rosary, and I was not a practicing Catholic at all at this time. So, and he said, uh, and he knew I was interested in Steiner. Uh huh. And he said, oh, so you must know about Slovia. I said who? Vladimir Slovia, the Russian philosopher. You don't know who that is? I said no. And so he told me a little bit about Slovia. So right. I found a book, which was not a very really good book. It's Paul Marshall Allen's biography of Slovyev. And the problem with anthroposophists when they write biographies, it's it's more about anthroposophy than it is about the person they're writing. In every about. single case. Every single time. But it but it, it was a great introduction and it had uh it reproduced the short narrative of the Antichrist. Yeah, wow, what a seminal, seminal piece. Which was blew me away. So that was my introduction. I was and then I started trying to find books by these Russians. Which, and at that time, it was really difficult to find them in English. Uh, yeah. Though I did, and but this is what happened. So right around the same time, I was at this used bookstore and I found uh, Slavery and Freedom by Nicholas Brajayo. And I started reading it. And I think it was, as far as reading philosophy goes, it was it was one of those watershed moments for me. Yeah. You know, because his his he's so radical, and he's so <laughs> daring, and he's and he doesn't uh, he's not constrained by even his membership in the Orthodox Church. No, he's a wild animal, and yeah. that's and kind of, he's been kind of my model for how to be a philosopher. <laughs> yeah, and then I was a lucky. Uh, I was where I went to school at Mary Grove College at the time. I. Uh, I wanted to, you know, I looked through the course catalog and they had these, all these really cool courses that they never offered. And I went to the, and I was an English major and I went and they were all courses in philosophy and theology. And I went to the, to the head of that department. I said, yeah, I keep wanting to take these classes, but you never offer them. Was, How about I just give them to you as a tutorial? Hmm. And I would do these tutorials with him every semester for a few years. Who is this professor? His name was George Elser. I love him dearly. And later he was my colleague there. And, uh, George was working on a PhD at Oxford under John McQuarrie, hmm. and he he bailed basically during his dissertation because he said he you know, he was doing it on, on Virgilio, I think. Yeah. And he said, "Doesn't matter. All this stuff doesn't matter." So he stopped. He was enlightened. And, uh, but what he was doing with me is he was giving me Oxford level tutorials at this little liberal arts college in the middle of Detroit. Wow. And one of the one one of the tutorials we did was on Christian ex existentialism. So I read Brajayev and I think we did Kierkegaard and Jaspers. Mm -hmm. So it was really, but the Brajayev is really what got me going. 
So he's still your favorite of all of them, you would say. I, for a long time, I would have said Solofiev, but I think over time, I have realized that how much more of an impression the Brajayev has made on me. Yeah, yeah. I noticed, so Solofiev probably, my introduction was through Brajayev. It took me to wanting to read more at this library. I think the next book I got was, uh, you know, it was just Ultimate Questions, a uh, compendium by uh, Alexander Schmemann, which had mm -hmm. seminal essays by Solovyev, Berjaev, Bulgakov, this mm -hmm. guy, you know, Pavel Florensky. I'm not, well, no, we know him. Uh, Vasily Rosnov is one I want to be more known. Again, in, in this compendium, Ultimate Questions, is an essay I've mentioned before, Sweet Jesus and the Bitter Fruits of the World. Mm -hmm. Rosanoff was like their court jester. You know, all these guys were running, complimenting each other, and he wasn't undermining them, but it was point counterpoint. And I, for me, I don't think we can understand these Silver Age guys as a group if we don't get Rosanoff. You know, he was so connected to matter, um, just preternaturally, you know? And so um, he's such a nice compliment. And then, um, but I think all of a sudden when I started reading Soloviev, uh, and uh, probably in particular, The Meaning of Love with the introduction by Barfield, which was just great. Yeah. Uh, he's probably been my guy. And again, the short tale of the Antichrist is that, that, that crystallization of just mm -hmm. so, so much. But, uh, you know, I go back and then I did read um, the major and minor trilogy of Bulgakov and so forth. But, you know, let's break these guys down a little bit. Um, okay. One other thing about Berjaev was, uh, tell me if you agree uh, with this is, uh, our experience on reading, it's kind of like an earthquake. At that time, again, in grad school, it seemed to me that theology in the West, and I also want to talk about, you know, orthodoxy and Catholicism. I was mentioning to you before we came on that there's a phenomenon in the Catholic Church, you know, the rad trads. And you and I don't beat up on it totally. We understand it, but we wonder if it's, you know, can tell the full tale. Um, but there's, there's also another one who are seeing, you know, they don't want to go that direction, but there would just be maybe to me, and I get the motivation and oversimplistic answer that all questions would be found in just like, you know, uh, going the opposite way of the Tiber and becoming fully Eastern Orthodox. Nonetheless, the uh, one experience I did have, and I give kudos to the Orthodox, is that in so much of the theology I was taking in grad school, and it's a great place, a shout out now to St. Bernard's Institute, in Rochester, New York, really neat things are happening there. And I, it's, I did get a good education there. But the... Um, and it's, there's a, even a new, there's a new spirit there that's doing great things. But I, I would read a lot of theology. And it seemed to me that the Roman Catholics, they were watching the news, whether it was NBC or ABC or just the mm -hmm. zeitgeist. And then they would come up theology to probably justify it in most cases, or to oppose it. Where slowly but patiently, in my sense, these uh, Silver Age guys were just dealing with the creed, you know, and maybe to reduce it to theosis is too easy. You know, God became man, but they just stayed with the implications of the creed and slowly work these out. And they were always in so many ways ahead of our brothers in the West. You know, mm -hmm. and so it did draw me to them, you know, that they weren't trying to be relevant, but it seemed in just doing the patient work, on time unfolding these things like a flower, uh, there, I, I realized there was another way. But, but the operative term here is sophiology, <laughs> Same right? More. Because that's what these guys, that, and, and so even, you know, the ortho bros, which we can call the, the red tread <laughs> version of orthodoxy, uh, that's where they draw the line, right? Well, I like Bulgakov, I like Sloviev, I like Florensky, but I don't want the Sophia thing. Wow, okay, but really? They kind of draw the line there. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of, uh, there's some pretty harsh criticism I've encountered, time, and it appears, I think, in the, in the submerged reality um, about how uneasy Sophia makes uh, the ortho bros, huh. right? Oh yeah, I mean, not, probably not all of the ones who might be listening to, to this broadcast, um, but a lot of people, you, you, and it, it's, it's a, it's a uh, place of contention, Sophia, for sure. But, but you can't think, you can't understand Bulgakov or Florensky or Slo, especially Slovia, or even, any of, or even uh, Berjaev without understanding Solovia or we understanding Sophia. I totally agree. It's impossible. Yep. Because they all drew on that. And it's interesting that uh so Solovia um was was a generation or so older than the, the other guys. He was. I would say he was there like and we could have some of this wrong. Like neither you or I are claiming to be foremost historians of this, but it seems to me Solovia have like 
just uh, with his lectures on God manhood, just set an earthquake into that whole. He did thing. absolutely, and and then then when he wrote Russia and the Universal Church, which he published in not in Russia but in in, in, in French, uh -huh. because his idea was that the Orthodox and Catholic churches should unite. Mm -hmm. That that the schism was was a was a just a political and um, convenience. And that the wild tune of force he has in that book too on like the tome of Saint Leo, you know, and sanity in the West and everything. I still think it's for ecumenism. I still think it's a great bouncing off point. It is, but it's interesting. Now, I don't know a few years ago, some Catholic publisher put out a, a new edition of that book, the Rush on the Universal Church, but took out the chapter on Sophia, wow. which is the conclusion. Shocking, but not shocking. The Catholics don't like it either, right? Mm -hmm. which is why we're heretics, Mike. I just want to let you know. Yeah. Uh, but I was going to say, so, so, you know, uh, Slovio is, is almost technically their godfather mm -hmm. to Bulgakov and uh, Burjayev. And Very much so. Yep. yep. And, and those guys were all friends. Those three were all friends. Mm -hmm. I've got a but, picture of, uh, again, Nesterov's famous painting of uh, Florensky and Bulgakov back there. I've seen it. Yep. Yeah, and there's Brajayev right above him. Yep. And and the thing is, uh, what's interesting. So maybe our, our listeners may not know this, but there was called I think it was called the Ship of the Philosophers. So when the Bolsheviks came to power, they told these guys, "Get out." And they all ended up at Saint Sergius. No. Okay. Uh, well, they they left for Paris. Um, Brajayev and Bulgakov did. Yeah, but uh, and Brajaya or Bulgakov by that point was was a priest, even though he had been a Marxist materialist. Right, right, right. You know, but he had a conversion. Florensky stayed behind. For sure. Florensky stayed behind, and eventually, you know, he 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 stayed behind because he was valuable to the Bolsheviks because he was setting up the electrical a genius. Grid. Yeah. yeah, and he he designed their electrical grid. You know, this is, he, they call him the, the Russian da Vinci because he was right, right. a multi, multiple genius, mm -hmm. you know, a polymath. And once he was no longer useful to them, they, they sent him to Siberia and killed him. So he's now considered a, a, a neo-martyr in the, in the Russian Orthodox Church. Yeah, you could almost picture him again, just the moment he wasn't useful to the system. You know, yeah. The structure, right? That's, uh, there's a, a, the microcosm and the macrocosm there. You know, you're speaking of the ortho bros. I wonder if they would. I finished a book a couple months ago. It's there in the public domain at archive.org, I think. But the um, it's called Knighthood of the Divine Sophia. Oh yeah. You know, and that that by, what's your name? Guys, well, I, I thought it was by a guy. It's a um, woman. Oh, is it? Yes. You know, it's really about Soloviev's you know relationship with the poet Block and uh, Bailey and so. You know, yes. Pretty fascinating book, but that I just think that title of a new knighthood would reach these. Um, kind of young people, because it is, you know, it, 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 it puts the whole idea of knighthood into a new key, not this kind of like hyper masculinity kind of weird stuff. Um, but it's, you know, it's the pursuing of Sophia through that some of the same themes we talked about with David Bentley Hart, and, um, you know, so many other times on this show, on this show. So let me ask you, uh, Rudolf Steiner's vis-a-vis -vis the Silver Age, uh, a biography, autobiography of uh, Berjaev, I recall, and I'm not going to be able to source all these things, but he, he, I think in Moscow, somewhere in Russia, he saw Steiner give a lecture and he had a very, very, very negative reaction where Pavel Florensky, I was just rereading this morning. I think one of the greatest chapters in theology in the history of the world is his chapter on friendship. Uh, but the, uh, a footnote to that one, you know, he's, he's, he's footnoting very favorably Rudolf Steiner. You know, you're more knowledgeable about Steiner than I am. Any other anecdotes or your sense of um, well, I, well I think what happened so uh Bellie, who was a friend of who, who actually became an anthroposophist when he left Russia mm -hmm. um he might have been interested before he left but he but he was living near Rudolf Steiner and uh he asked his Berjayev to come and check this guy out and Berjayev went I mean I don't think he was impressed by the lecture but in others of other of his books, he he's not all team anthroposophy, but he speaks very favorably of Steiner in some places. Okay, so and, I read and, all my Berjaya before finding Steiner, 
and I've reread a lot, but that's, I'm so glad I asked you. He did, I found it. And in fact, he's got an article, which I have saved on my computer, uh, on theosophy and anthroposophy. This mm -hmm. is by Art by Barjaya. Okay. Um, which is interesting. Um, so, but but me, none of these guys were afraid to go off the reservation, right? Right, right. And that's what's interesting with Bulgakov too. I think what, what you see with Bulgakov, um, he tries to rein it in, <laughs> but I just don't think by disposition he was able to totally rein it in. Because even when the, he was censored, and he, or he censured for uh, talking about Sophia, he's like, okay, I want to talk about it. And then he talked about it, right? Wow. He, so he just kept doing his thing mm -hmm. um, to his credit and our benefit. Um, but like you said, Florensky speaks positively of Steiner. He quotes, I think, from Theosophy in uh, The Pillar and Ground of the Truth. Mm -hmm. uh, but both of those guys, right? So Florensky and, and Bulgakov were both priests. So they were answerable to bishops. Mm -hmm. So... And so that's why I think you see a big difference between their freedom to speak, which was ent entire, and Berjaev's freedom to speak, because he wasn't ordained and he can just say what he wanted. Right. Right. And uh, interesting with, he, though, and the same thing happened with Solofiev. I mean, he was not ordained either, but, you know, he endured a lot of, of criticism and censure because of his ideas. Right. Sure. They didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And I, and, there is a there is a thought that when he was sick toward the end of his life that he was received into the Catholic Church. I don't know if it's true, but I don't think he would have thought it as being received into the Catholic Church because I think, and, and I feel like this myself, that there's not really any difference between the Catholic and the Orthodox Church. And right now, the Orthodox girls are losing it. <laughs> We're saying that they did. I had when I when I was interviewed by John Pajot a few months ago. Some people because I described myself as a Byzantine Catholic at the time. And uh, and I said basically, there's no difference between being Byzantine Catholic and Orthodox because there's not. Yeah, there's not. It's the same theology. The only difference is the Pope. <laughs> That's the only difference. But they're gonna they're gonna talk about uh, the um, what's our creedal thing there? So <laughs> sorry. The, oh, um, the the filioque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, most 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 Byzantine Catholic churches don't say the filioque when they say yeah. the creed. And also, Bulgakov approached that question directly, and he said, you know. For, for dogma doctrine to be important, it has to have perceived effects, right? So we could say like, if we wanna look into some aspects of Hinduism and say, wow, they're really denigrating the human body or because of that religion, you know, women are not appreciated. You could look at maybe funeral pyres and so forth and the practices, but uh, Bulgakov surveyed all of culture he, and where this difference was and he goes, you can't see it play out in Peoria at all. You know the notion of proceeding from the father, the father and the son. But you know, he goes, it, there's, it doesn't play out. So let's move beyond it. And I think and that's, there's, but there's also there's scriptural scriptural warrant for it when Jesus says, "Receive the Holy Spirit and breathes on them." Mm -hmm. so, yep. so, and the son makes sense in that regard, right? Yep, yep, yep. These guys just were not caught up in that stuff. It's oh, they don't. One of the reasons. Oh, yeah, that's right. I mean, the the. You know, and you hear people talk in the Catholic side and the Orthodox side about reun reuniting the churches, right? It's like, you know, rebuilding since since 1049. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Come on, who are you guys kidding? They don't want to get together. No. There's too much at stake for these bishops. Yeah, no, right. Right? So so my thing, <laughs> so I, that's why I think Berjaev was more, that's why I, I think I like him a little bit more than those other guys because he was freer to speak. He was he yep, yep. I'm trying to think. And the, the other thing we should mention is for both Slovyev and Brajayev, and to a lesser degree the other guys, but certainly there too, the the, the enormous importance of Yaka Burma. For all of them. Yeah, I and mean, let's, I mean let's, let's give credit where credit is due. Our friend Matt Milliner, who was on a few weeks ago, you know, he's just saying, you know, that you know, when when people do uh, cross the Tiber and become Catholic or become Orthodox. They're so grateful that like in these in these lineages, they have the great mystical tradition. And Milner is saying all of them came from a Protestant, Yaakov Fermat. Yeah, that's right? true. And we need that wake up call. And again, your specialty in the English, the Anglicans and so forth. So, um, you know, it's almost like the human mind. You know, we are still tribal. We look for reasons, even though the the 
great case against it, like Burma, is uh, hidden in plain sight, you know. But you know, we we become Catholic, we become sacramental for this great mystical tradition, and right. there it all stems from Burma. But I think this is what you know, like I've mentioned before, that uh, the original subtitle of the submerged reality was something like ecology, ecumenism, and whatever else it was. I can't remember. But ecumenism is a is an important facet of sociology, and you can see it in these thinkers, right? And especially, especially you see it, you know, clearly in Soloviev, who is arguing on behalf of uniting in the Catholic and the and the Orthodox churches and thinking that the the Protestants will follow, which is actually what the theme of the narrative of the Antichrist. It is, is right. It is, yeah. That's what happens, and and I think it's no, important to for the, those of you listeners who have not read that book. Find it. You can, I'm sure you can find it on uh, for free online. You can might be the short story of the Antichrist. Sometimes it's called it that. It should be on the bestseller list right now. So it's so topical. It, it should be because perfect. what happens at the end of that story or in, in, through the course of the story is the Antichrist wants the, the churches to offer <laughs> incense to Caesar. Mm -hmm. And two thirds of all the churches go along with it. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, and then finally, the character, now it's beautifully symbolic. The, the three leaders of the of the three churches are Pope Peter, the elder John, and Professor Ernst Pauli. So it's it's Peter, John, and Paul. That, that right? can take us pretty far, I think. You know, let me mention another name. You know, a real, a great descendant of these people is Olivier Clément, um, who is another Russian who spoke in Paris. He's got a book called On Human Being, which is totally and utterly seminal. I have a feeling, though I don't know Russian or French, that the translation to English, it feels kind of uh, clunky. Late, kind of heavy, clunky. It's kind <coughs> of where, um, he had a book when Pope John Paul II, I think, and it could have been early Benedict, called for different theologians to submit their, their understanding of Peter. The best were the bunch. You know, there was a bishop from out in LA who wrote one. A lot of people, and I read all of them at the time. Uh, Clémence was by far the best. And he did use that as kind of a framing, you know, that the Protestants were the Church of Paul, you know, that Peter was wrong on circumcision, folks. He was. Paul corrected yeah, him. Yeah, Paul corrected him. And that, you know, John was the more Eastern mystical church and Peter was the more kind of hierarchical structure one. Yeah. Um, so we don't want to get locked up by that, but I want, I, I can only speak for myself. It's but that's what Sylvia was drawing on. Yep, that, yep. That's exactly what he was drawing on. But the, the, for me, the interesting thing is, is, is that, the remnants of these three churches unite at the end. And the reason they unite is because the elder John stands up in this big assembly of all the churches and tells the Antichrist, we would be happy to follow you. Yeah. All you have to do is confess Christ right now. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you do, can't it. do it. Right. right. Do you think there's an analogy you said in the short tale of the Antichrist, two thirds of the people went with the Antichrist during the, um, uh, what they call the concordat in France during the French Revolution. I was studying these statistics. You know, how many how many priests when uh, it was called the, uh, um, you know, when they set up the national church, you know, all these names should be right there for me. But, you know, you had to sign the loyalty oath to the nation. About, I think that the understanding is that like when these things happen, like when the COVID crisis happened, it seems to me like a certain percentage, I'd guess how many, uh, just kind of, they loved being wardens of the biopolitical state, especially the state. Mm -hmm. There's a crisis of insignificance in the yeah. priesthood. All of a sudden, this thing came out. And a lot of people said, like, sign me up. I finally feel important. My real priesthood is working for the state. Well, in the French Revolution, I think the stats are around, like, 66%, right? So mm -hmm. it's that two-thirds number again that when when people are given the choice of a clerics, are you going to are you gonna be with us or with the state? Um, they're going to sign up with the state. And I think yeah. the lay people in the pews need to see this. You know, well, I, we watched it in real time over the last three years, my man. We sure did. We, we sure did. did, and and that's why I got. That's why we've been doing house church. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, now it's interesting that you mentioned that. Now maybe our listeners don't know, but uh, Vladimir Soloviev's nephew, uh, I think it was was he Mikhail? I think his name was. Or he was no, he was Soloviev's brother, Mikhail's br son. I think he was uh, Sergei. But he was uh, a Catholic priest. He was the last Catholic priest in in Moscow, and he was really? underground under the Bolsheviks until one of his one of his parishioners ratted him out to the officials. Bastard! And they arrested the whole parish. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, and and in fact, it's interesting that uh, 
speaking of the Russian Silver Age, I mean, another important figure who's not really part of that, but certainly influenced it, was Dostoevsky. I want to say, I, I recently reread Berjayev's book on Dostoevsky, and I just think it's great. And let me make one point that when I first read it again in his book on Dostoevsky, that in our time, you know, so Berjayev on Dostoevsky says like, and I'm still saying in roughly in our time, you have, you know, what I think in modernity is the greatest compiler, uh, the greatest saint of this notion of like, it's all there in the church fathers, it's all there in the church fathers, Mm -hmm. and it's Theophane the recluse. And um, Berjayev looked at Dostoevsky's work and looked at Theophane. And I think in this book, he, he said that you know, Theophane was alive during Dostoevsky's writing right. and that there had to be an admission that there are things about the depths of the human person, our conflicted nature, you know, the way we come together that just aren't there in the church fathers. Right. And so, again, this notion for the, you know, whether we have the uh, ortho bros or the people who are just finding it all there, you know, it's just another mantra, the church fathers, the church fathers. And you and I both, we do stand on the shoulders of giants with the church fathers. But what is it in the human makeup that we always want to close things off that there can't be anything after them? You know, and said that, you know, Theophane said there's just things in Dostoevsky that are not there. So hence, people, we do, as you say, we have to go off the res. We have to right. go off. And I think what you, this is why I think uh, what you see is a similar thing in Burma. This is why I think uh, uh, Brajaya was, was, was uh, interested in both Dostoevsky and Burma, because that darkness is something he's talking about, the unground, mm-hmm. you know, which it doesn't respond well. And this is one of my criticisms of the people who get all worked up about the neo-patristic synthesis or about the fathers is, you know, to me, one of the problems with not everything, but m- many of the fathers is they're kind of contaminated by neoplatonism. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, I wouldn't say it's anti-Christian, but it's not always, uh, congruent with with christianity it's not and we got to put saint augustine in that same boat right i know yeah yep. i do i do put him in the same boat and, and he was but you know he saint augustine was trained as a neoplatonist basically he was plotinus 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 yeah and and there's nothing wrong with that but i think people don't think they don't think critically about it because but the fathers but i don't i think that's that's intellectually lazy yeah to, to do that. And, and, and the thing is, I think that's why people are attracted to, you know, this kind of really uh, strict conservative uh, orthodoxy or dread, dread Catholics is because you got all the answers given to you, right? right. It's so much easier, mm-hmm. right? I got, I have an authority. Okay. Which is, you know, that's where, <laughs> and then the next step is clericalism, right? right? There's another way to get at this too. You know, I'd started, I still haven't finished the third one. But about a year ago at this time, I started what I thought would be a trilogy over at Front Porch Republic on uh, kind of recasting theology in a new key. And I called it the return to the therapeutic. But anyhow, in the second one, I kind of focused on Dostoevsky's Christianity. And as I mentioned, this notion about there are things to do, but the other one, Berjaev, on Dostoevsky said, this is, I just think it, it's a summons to people to like look at things in different ways. But he said, uh, importantly, that you know, Dostoevsky was not about theology. It was all about anthropology and psychology. Um, you know, and so, you know, when can our seminary start bringing in more of a deep insight? You know, they sh- should be reading Gabor Mate. They should be reading like the great Jung, you know, and again, none of these guys are conclusive and final, but like, wouldn't our churches be different if we were reading into the depths of the human being? So anthropology and psychology, and let's yeah. just admit that theology you know, I, I mentioned, I'm going to repeat something that um, uh, I, I spent a whole weekend about two months ago listening to a local, the St. Bernard's Institute. They had the definitive conference on 50 years of communio, right? So it was on von Balthasar de Lubach and uh, mm-hmm. uh, Ratzinger, uh, Pope Benedict. You and I both love that movement, Michael. On the other hand, there was all these topics and they were using the communio outlook. And you know, I always say this phrase like 2000 years into the incarnation, we would have a great panel of scholars. And they were talking about like apocastasis and so forth. And there was 50 other subjects and there was a pattern. They could start kind of high up theology. And then when they had to bring it down, it led into what I would say, like your term, poetic metaphysics was what was needed, or it led into anthropology. 
or it led into um, psychology. Mm -hmm. And so theology beyond <laughs> calling, I guess I've got to figure this stuff out. I need a language, but I'm going to say theology has now met the quantum limit and it, it can only go so far. And below that, we need to use new tools. So theology, right. I'm going to say it's just very limited at our time. It, it, at one sense, the political theologians we will do a whole deep dive on that sometime in this uh, series of podcasts. The political theologians are saying again, because of the problems with the public square, the naked public square was never naked, you know, and that it's true that, you know, everybody has a metaphysics. Uh, so they say the theology is the queen of the sciences again, you know, so the people who want the new theocracy. Right. And you and I have problems with that. We're going to address it head on. We, We're not going to we avoid anything. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll hit it soon. But so if, at the same time, a lot of people are saying theology is the queen of the sciences. I'm saying no, not in that in that way. There's some good insights coming from that movement. But at the right. other hand, theology is even, it's meeting a limit beyond which we have to go to poetry, psychology, and anthropology to understand what's going on. Again, Claymont's book is called On Human Being, you know, what it means to be a human being. Right. And I think that's that's really brilliant, Mike, because I think the more the older I get, the more important I, I think uh, the lack of a sound anthropology poisons everything. Everything, you know. That's why one of one of the things that attracts me to Rolf Steiner is he's got a really sound anthropology, far out, you know, but st sound. you know what I mean. Yeah. But but just even if you do, don't even talk about reincarnation and stuff, but when he talks about the different bodies, the physical yeah. body, the etheric yeah. body, the astral body, and the ego, that's a sound anthropology, and he and he applies it to child development, which is really, really helpful and wise. But I think, you know, I grew up in Catholic schools. I've, taught at a Catholic college, <laughs> and I, I have yet to encounter a sound anthropology other than man is born in sin and needs Christ for redemption, right? Let's talk about original sin, too, of these that's guys. That's it. That's not anthropology. That's, that's uh, I don't know what that is, but but I think, and, and this goes back to the fathers as well, right? Um, here, I'm going to pull something off my bulletin board right here. You're gonna yell Let's at your talk, I want to talk anthropology. Let's talk anthropology right there there's adam and eve there there is adam and eve uh, now in in the fathers you encounter the notion not with not with not universally but you encounter the notion that where they question and this is something i got i read from first in uh another silver well, kind of a late silver age theologian uh oh, oh my gosh what's his name paul Oh, of uh, Paul of Dachau, yeah, yeah. where some of the fathers questioned whether women even had souls. Mm -hmm. And then you read Tertullian in his book, uh, in the English translation is On the Adornment of Women, where he basically accuses women for being pretty, for causing not only the downfall of, of Adam, but the crucifixion. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, come on, you psychos. And it's there in Aquinas. We have to get out of here, right? So it's that's so that's an anti anthropology. An and anti -anthropology. I think, what even, and I correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I think what we see now with all the gender stuff going on in culture, I think this really lies at the feet of the church Same for way. excluding Sophia from the anthropology. Yeah. <clears throat> and another Orthodox theologian who had been Catholic, uh, Alexander or Alexis Mensbrugge was Belgian and be, he was a Benedictine and became Orthodox and eventually an or, archbishop. And he writes in his book uh, From Dyad to Triad, which I think came out in 1930 something. This is what I'm not familiar with. Yep. It's hard to find. I, I I I had to do when I was at Marygrove College, I had to get the library to find it. So they did a search, they had to pay for the book to be delivered, and I copied it because there's no way you're gonna find this book. But in that book, he, he suggests that when uh, in Genesis, when God says, let us make man on our image, he's not talking to the, the son and the, and, the, and the spirit, he might be too, but he's actually speaking to Sophia. Yeah. Which makes more sense. Yeah. It man is a lot male that. and female created he them, right? Which comes right after that. Right. So yeah. I think that's, I mean, I think, Genesis offers us a, a pretty sound anthropology. Well, even, even the great Jacques Ellul, whose picture is back there too, 
you know, there's, a, I think it's a subset of a book, but over at like a Christian anarchy page, you get a great essay on like morality and women. And he says like, when, sci when society comes out of control, like it's doing now, there's a huge temptation in history to like, just um, instead of being nuanced, you know, and to find the moral law comes out with a moral code and thwaps it on. And he mm -hmm. says, in every case, women just get like, screwed by that they get hammered well they're getting hammered right now with the gender stuff right they are they are and he, he knew that you know and again this will seem cliche to some people but if you look at creation and genesis as you're saying you know that the woman is the crowning glory right she was the last thing created coming out of adam's rib um mm -hmm. and you know it's not just a, it's not yeah. a, what they call in academics now like an interesting move uh, in the hands of somebody as kind of uh biblically astute as a lull a rare find in the 20th century this guy was barf you know, he had all Barth's knowledge and more about right. the Bible. He wasn't just throwing out a move there. You know, this guy was deeply, his whole life was the the narrative of uh, holy writ. And yeah. you're right. All these things screw women over. Yeah, and you remind me of when you talk about women, be, women being the crowning of, of creation is there's a great line from Robert Poem's song slash poem, Green Grow the Rushes, which is, which says, uh, about God, his prentice hand, he tried on man, and then he made the lassies, huh. right? Is that the one where you posted Steve Winwood singing that song on a... Uh, I posted Dougie McLean singing that one. Okay. One time. It's a really, one of my favorite songs. In fact, my wife and I sang it at my son's wedding. Wow. Green Brother, it's a beautiful song. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, so, so that's what's interesting is these Silver Age theologians, especially the ones we mentioned, I think they were issuing a corrective to a faulty Christian anthropology. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. By introducing Sophia into it. Mm -hmm. Because you know it's not, and it's not like they were, and this is what I don't like about so many feminist theologians who never mention these guys for one thing, but also appropriate uh, Sophia as a political figure, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is totally wrong, and it, I don't. I read that stuff, and it makes me sick to my stomach right, right, because right. I think that's exactly wrong. That's that could be more wrong. Yeah. Like uh, what's the name, Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza? Yeah. Horrible. I mean, I read that stuff as a in graduate school, and I was like, come on. Yeah. Um, Miller but, was great on that stuff. If people want to go back and listen, he knew how to separate the wheat from the chaff. Yeah, he was good. He was good. Um, and I went to you know I went to a, a Jesuit college or university for my master's degree and that place was that place was just rotten with that kind of thought mm -hmm. um as you can imagine um but but was, anyway what i was saying is i with uh this restoration of sophia to her proper place in theology and um anthropology there's this great opportunity for for healing mm -hmm. Without you know, the politics always poisons things. Right. But you know, if and then this is the thing, it's very biblical and it's very commonsensical. Now, people always say it's such a mystical thing, this Sophia. No, it's not. It's very phenomenological and practical. And if you just look at things as they are, mm -hmm. they will reveal themselves to you. And this is what it reveals. And this is what Mintzberg is for reading of Genesis tells me for yeah. instance. Yeah. And I think even if you go into uh, Blagakov, when he, and this is as sophiological as it gets, when in his book on the Holy Grail, and he talks about the earth itself as the Holy Grail because it held the blood of Christ, mm -hmm. and that the earth itself was transformed at that moment into a, a living being as it was dying. And this is, and I'm sure he got this from Steiner. This is one of Steiner's key points. Mm -hmm about the crucifixion, which is what made Steiner break with the theosophists because he started to see not only the spiritual, but the ontological significance of the blood falling on, on the earth at Golgotha, mm -hmm. right? That it, yeah. it changed everything. everything. And it's not just, that's not a conceptual idea. That Even is a his chemical. His on the Mexican mysteries, you can see that Steiner wants to posit that things happened in the American continents at the same time. Mm -hmm. So he was, uh, there's a great guy again, Stephen Clark, C-L-A-R-K-E. Yeah. But it's great stuff. But he, he, again, Steiner had a lot of the dates wrong. There wasn't too much information and things, but he was still pointing to something really powerful that Christ's salvific death and the blood hitting the earth over in Palestine influenced things in Mesoamerica, right? Yeah, well, uh, and you know, there's a story too that 
in Greece. Uh, I can't remember who wrote this. It's in, I wrote about it in Sophia in Exile. But uh, that at the moment of the crucifixion, sa sailors heard a voice coming across the sea saying, the great pan is dead. That's beautiful. And where Bede, and I think it was Bede, interpreted that as meaning pan, the god of, you know, the, the favorite god of the, the, the Greek peasantry was dead. But other interpretations mean that whoever was saying that felt that life itself was dying at the crucifixion. Right, that, right, that, right. That Christ was really the great pan mm -hmm. in that sense, right? Yep. So, so, well, let me ask so you there's too. a lot going on there. There's a lot going on. I uh, remember when we had David Cayley on, maybe he was two of our first three episodes, but in his you know seminal book on Illich, he, he has a chapter that I think got excised, maybe it's still in there, but uh, when we're talking about an anthropology and a psychology being so necessary, in order to get at Illich, he felt he had to take a digression into say like, whatever happened in the West about the question of man, you know? And again, he said, maybe it was the language that all of a sudden if you had to say like man, human being, but he just, he just, and I'd have to go back to it, but it's kind of like what we're getting at. But in the West, we just started just doing theology again, when there was a seminal moment where people are asking like, who are we as human beings and so forth? And he, you know, that guy's pretty polymathic in one sense. He just said it was like, uh, you know, like strangled in the cradle, this question about man in the West. And we just need to pick that up again, completely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, those are, I mean, and I tell my students, you know, you know, these are the fundamental philosophical gestures, yeah, yeah. right? Who are we? Why are we here? They're very simple questions, but they're so hard to answer, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. One more. One but more, they're worth uh, investigating. Absolutely. Another, uh, we mentioned Verjaev, and we're going to do a whole show on him, hopefully very soon. We're looking for the right person. The um, reading a book, you're going to hear more about this guy, Gerald Hurd. He was one of these people hanging out with Alan Watts and Audrey Huxley out in California. It, right now, he strikes me as uh, light years ahead of all of them. Um, didn't really know of him, maybe because Christ is so central to him. You know, that would explain it all. But mm -hmm. uh, he was in a book I'm reading now. It was called The Eternal Gospel. He's got some footnotes on Verjaev. And just uh, this is another commonplace observation. But he wondered, you know, the focus on in the West, which we see pronounced in the evangelical tradition, again, not everything bad about that but right. on redemption. And he thinks, you know, the Berjaev noticed that in the East and these Russians were playing, and we think of Bogakov's book called The Comforter, but the Holy Spirit did have a bigger role. So we want to say why young people could be drawn to that. But the notion of sanctification, maybe as it ties into theosis, but like we have our conversion experience, but there's much, much, much more we have to do. If we want to say that the Eastern tradition and the Silver Age theologians got that better than most in the West, then we're supposed to say, props to you, you know, an insight granted, we need to learn from that. Mm -hmm. But how it plays out with everybody saying you have to like now join a completely different church or something. And I that's, guess. Yeah. That don't, I, I, and that's why I think where Brajayev really comes in handy. I mean, because a lot of these people, and they're probably not reading Brajayev, because he's so apocalyptic. Because <laughs> the, the ortho bro gesture for a lot of people is well, I'm not safe. It's like, you know, I made it to the Orthodox Church <sighs> and, the, and the Rad Trads do the same thing, right? I'm safe. I'm safe. Let everything else die. Uh -huh. But, you know, Barjaev says, look it, we were supposed to save the world. Yep. And now Christianity is about to be extinct. And he was saying this in 1930 something, right? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and he asks, we have to ask if the future belongs to man or to something else. And he's right. talking about technology. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so he's so he's a, he's a, he's scary for a lot of people, and he, well, he he should be because he think he's telling more truth, in a way than the other guys who are still constrained by their their clerical vows of obedience. Yeah, and, you know, who did he love in the West? You know, he put you in touch with uh, Mikhevich in Poland. You know, there were some radicals all around. You know, and Berjayev knew how to find them. His again, his little notes at the bottom of the pages. He put me in touch, to be honest, with Leon Bloy. You know, who's a yeah. Catholic, um, in his book on the Jews, um, and he helps you get access to Bloy, like what to read, what not to read, and all I've read all of Bloy. But uh, uh, it, it's again, these people are found everywhere. We just, you know, we need to find these people who are exploring, who are who are daring and not playing it safe. You know. Um, how about as we kind of get close to winding up, tell people like if you were, if we had some listeners 
who, and I'll try this after you, um, you know, I noticed when I was looking at Berjaev's titles, so many of them are, uh, so we have, you know, the meaning of history, the meaning of the creative act, the destiny of man. There's that question of man again, uh, Dostoevsky. Um, but a lot of the other ones are slavery and freedom, beginning and end, the divine and human, spirit and reality. Um, if you were just, not just on Berjaev, if you were to invite people into exploring kind of this wonderful constellation of authors, um, kind of step by step, not giving them, how would you invite them in? And I'll try it after you. Um, I would say, you know, I, probably the more accessible books by Solovia. I, I would say, uh, uh, le lectures on divine humanity mm -hmm. for certain and actually the russian and the universal churches needs one to understand too yeah. but also so is the meaning of life love but where he gets into the heart of his teaching is really in lectures on god manhood mm -hmm. um Berjaev, he's just kind of <laughs> it's a wild animal i think it, the first thing it, i would say meaning the creative freedom. act is his best but uh or his most packed I read, yeah, but I love, I mean, they're all, basically, he writes the same book every single time he writes a book, but adds yeah. more stuff. Yeah, yeah. So you can almost jump in any place with, with Burjaya. <clears throat> Bulgakov, now, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know if it's as, a, as readable and in translation as available, but one, Sophia. I don't think it's very good. Or maybe, again, the one translation you and I both read. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, because I that's the first one I read, and I couldn't get into it. Though I do think... Uh, the, well, where I did get him was the book on the Holy Grail. Right. And the I, other one is uh, um, The Bride of the Lamb. Yeah, so that's, that's, I would say, so Bride of the Lamb <laughs> is probably the one I've spent the most time with. Yeah. Um, but get, continue, I'll go on after. No, I think, I think that's, that was, I think that's a really a rich, rich text right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that whole trilogy is really, is really worth mm -hmm. your time. Um, um, and, and Florensky, there, there was a lot of, there's more out by Florensky now, but the text is, uh, the, the pillar. pillar and ground of the truth, yeah. Yeah. which, and I gave a lecture at Cambridge back in September via Zoom, because my mother was dying at the time, I couldn't leave that it was on on, on Florensky and I <laughs> remember telling them and they were mostly orthodox it was for the uh, Institute of Orthodox, orthodox Christian Studies at Cambridge and I remember it saying I said you know we should just own that a lot of the things this is, guy says are technically heretical yeah, yeah you know because they are I mean we we can't but I think what happens with theologians if they, they're they're dedicated to a pers uh, a particular perspective of whatever the, their faith tradition is you know but they so they try to fit people like Burjaev or not Burjaev but they would both Bulgakov or Florensky into this particular box he sees orthodox see what he means by Sophia is an orthodox thing mm -hmm. said, yeah maybe but I think he's pushing the envelope and I think you need to rethink things which is why people distance themselves from Bulgak Bulgakov and they call him the most brilliant theologian but they can't get with the sophiology well that's all he does it's all he does that it's is his self that is his theology yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah that, so that, that, that's that book not actually interesting with a pillar and ground of the truth uh it even though he doesn't quote him that book made an enormous impact on on valentin tomberg didn't know that okay. and i think it is the model upon which Tom Berg wrote Meditations on the Tarot. Because he has, a symbol, he has a symbol with each letters. chapter. Yep, letters and uh, like these, uh, the illustrations. And an emblem. An emblem. Right, which is, Florensky has these different like, kind of uh, early modern emblems that he mm -hmm. uses, like you see in alchemical text, whatever. And you also, but, but and so in, in Tom Berg, it's the cards of the tarot, the major account of the tarot. But I am certain that was what his model was. That makes sense, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I would say um, for Berjaev, uh, maybe because I'm, I always tend to think of young people, but right now I might hit the theme of uh, 
it would be fun because uh, talking to young people, again, the major theme is loneliness, right? I remember talking to our friend Sherry, Nate Heil. We were talking about esotericism and exotericism. And I almost thought like, you know, friendship, learning how to make friends is the new esotericism. Mm -hmm. Because all of us were so lonely and we're reading esoteric stuff. Like so many young people I know, they're just trying to read their Tom Bird, but they don't know how to make friends. Uh, right. So I would introduce people to Burjaya of Solitude and Society. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, then pick up the pillar and ground of truth, get it online. And again, start with the chapter on friendship, which is interesting, right? Because we have, even if we say the crowd is the mask of community and like an individual is a mask of the human person, you know, just trying to be different. You look at the crowd being different is different than being yourself. Uh, but Florensky in that book, what he does is he raises the dyad, the person and their friend as the nucleus. No longer is it just the individual. And he also proves that we can't be an individual or a person without, we can never be anything outside of communion. Mm -hmm. But um, if you were a young person thinking about like how we need to remake society, you know, and your theme was loneliness, which for so many it is, you know, and suicidal thoughts included. Right. So you could go to Florensky, read friendship, and then branch out. The next chapter, jealousy, it says, I get it, I think it's kind of liberating. Again, if the worst is the corruption of the best, envy is that, you know, Michael, you and I could have a special relationship, you know, that we have this thing we do on a podcast. We have all these things that we kind of drive with one another. But um, you, you could have a friendship with uh, John Geltner that's different from that. But uh, jealousy is prizing what you and I have, but it doesn't have to put anybody else down. Envy mm -hmm. is this notion that to put other people down. And yeah. so this is a seminal distinction for us that he's making in the chapter that follows friendship. Uh, because yeah. everybody needs to relearn. It's almost like we need to relearn how we can have these wildly intimate personal relationships that isn't just with our spouse. You know, again, this phrase I use, two sparrows in a hurricane. So go to Florensky. Um, and then for Soloviev, again, I, I agree with you that we want to get into a sophiology, but I'm going to encourage people, pick it up. Owen Barfield writes this introduction, The Meaning of Love. Yeah. You know, just school yourself in a whole new way of approaching the world. And then we can dial back, you know, I... Um, I think Ultimate Questions by Schmemann that has essays uh, from all the <clears throat> right? This author I talked to you, Paul, I think his first name is Valerie from uh, Baylor University, I believe, but Modern Russian Theology, um, Theology in a New Key by this guy is a great, yeah. uh, fantastic introduction. Um, and so then people would, you and I both think they'd be off and running because the, the benefit for me, for young people, maybe following that thing on just our human relatedness with others, yeah. is um is maybe they can help build the parallel polis our theme right? yeah i like that you know and i think you're right, right mike and I, you know what else um i think one of the things i see with both red treads and the ortho bros that i think is unhealthy and this is a, a one and uh Brajayev saw this years and years ago that there's a a preoccupation with a kind of what would Berge would call a false asceticism mm -hmm. right so this which 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 begs for a solitude in a way right mm -hmm. and how they lionize the desert fathers and i've even seen this is these were trad catholics who were were fathers online bewailing the fact that they've have had sex because they're married that it was a source of sin i'm like oh my god just get get thee to a therapist right but Soloviev, who uh there's a, a tremendous eros that runs through his and he was in love a few times but never married right um and he died at 47 um but he had an interesting thing and i can't remember what book this is in that uh, that uh he mentions that you know he and he's actually what he's doing you think he's his book on or his, his lecture on the medieval mind or something but what it, one of the things he said is comparing western to eastern monasticism mm -hmm. right where eastern monasticism tends toward you know um the love separating right? yep, being yep. separate and then the hermitage kind of idea right mm -hmm. being separate and isolated from others right mm -hmm. well Sloviev does it like phenomenology 101 and says no 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 when christ sent the apostles out he didn't send them into the desert mm -hmm. he sent them to the people yep right so that's uh, and i think it's an important thing to keep in mind because there is a there's a temptation with these these uh these radical uh 
uh, con I'm a conservative, but rad trad or ortho bro uh, movements to, well, they, and you see this with Rod Dreher to a degree too, right? With the Benedict option mm -hmm. to, and it's not, and it's not the same thing as the parallel polis that we're talking about. Nope. It's uh, rejecting the world. Yep. And God, Christ sent the, that's what he said, the, he sent the apostles into the world, not into the desert, mm -hmm. right? So the, you you got to figure out how to do this in a way that's not a, a bunker mentality. And can we bring in a theme that we brought up earlier, which is um, anthropology. Again, I'm intimately familiar with men who lived a way of life according to the rule of St. Benedict. The rule of St. Benedict <laughs> is not a mystical treatise. It's a work of human anthropology and sociology. And uh, the key word is discretion, right? That's why Pope Gregory the Great, when he was elevated, uh, that he, there's a genius in that work and it's how people of different temperaments might get along. Without something like the rule of St. Benedict, even you and I, if we started a community or something, it's gonna come to naught. If we're all just, all we have is highfalutin asceticism and uh, prayer and everything because what you need is a work of discretion and how it is that people of different temperaments can get the hell along, right? And so it's anthropology and psychology again. And that's, what a, that's what a community is. And that's why, and not, totally not a sociologist, but that's what attracts me so much to the poetry of, of Robert Herrick. Uh -huh. Because, you know, it's dealing with everything. It's dealing with the beauties of May Day and liturgy and the rosary but also writing epigrams <laughs> about about some of the annoying people in the parish right yep. so it's all together that's what a parish is right yep. Yep. it's like a family a family is the same way right ideally ideally you know and again maybe we need to get parishes whether the answer is small christian communities or not you know i, I don't rule that out ahead of time you know sometimes there's buzzwords but uh you know there is a science again in this stuff that really a community can't be too much larger than say 20 if you're really going to have this kind of like uh despondent you know and how yep. do we you know but these are there are sciences out there and we should study them and say how should Love they is beautiful yep yeah absolutely Love is beautiful any concluding remarks have we or have we introduced these guys pretty well and thoroughly um just <laughs> I mean, this I, I don't know if you heard this one before it's one of my favorite quotes it's from a guy who's who's uh connected to the to these silver age theologians uh, Lev Shestov yeah he's great and I have gotten, I posted this once on social media and I got more crap from people I thought were, were like us about it. He but walked, Shestov walked, said- free, Or is it Lev Gillette? One of them was as Roman Catholic as they were Eastern Orthodox. No, Shestov was Orthodox, but Shestov, what he, what he said was a God who can't change the past is no God at all. That's heavy. Right, isn't that, that's worth meditating on, right? Mm -hmm. The Lord of the back. Sabbath. Yeah, amen. Right? So, what are you going to do this weekend? Uh, uh, I don't know. The weather is, after we had that super cold weather at Christmas, mm -hmm. where it's three below zero, um, it's been relatively mild for winter. Is there anything you try? I'm waiting for the sun to make me. There's a bunch of trees I still have to cut up out in the woods. Mm -hmm. But I've been, I haven't been spending as much time outside as usual because I've been doing other bunch of editing gigs and okay. getting ready to teach. How about you? Uh, I think well, our youngest will head back to his university town and uh, we have the three-day weekend, which feels like it's so close to what we've just come off. But, uh, oh, you know, a few more family things. And I've, I think I can, I think one thing I'm going to do is start an article for uh, volume eight of Jesus, the imagination. Tell people that, about- Oh, you know, that's another thing I should yeah. announce. Uh, I don't know if you caught this, but I announced that I'm doing an online course. Yes, tell people. On Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare, religion, and magic, which Please will take place on people. Fridays, starting the beginning of February. It's eight weeks. So if you, if you're interested in that, go to my my uh, blog on uh, the Center for Sociological Studies dot com, and you can find it right there. So yeah, I'm hoping to do. And that. part of the reason I'm doing this is because uh, I, I I'm trying to do it for homeschool age kids too, I'm not not for that online, but in person. But that's a little harder to to arrange. But I want people like my daughters who would like to take things like this to do this. But also, um, this is a step toward what I would call a, a kind of a flying university or a hedge school. Yep. Because I think there's a great need for it, and I write more about that in the in the blog post that announces this that uh, 
but you know, and I, I teach part time at a, at a liberal arts college here, but they, I was lo just looking at the course offerings. There are, are almost zero literature courses in the wow. yeah, right, right, right. And they've gotten rid of philosophy and religion, they're getting rid of religious studies. And this is at a Methodist school. Wow. And, uh, and this is the way it's going. And this is the way of higher ed. Mm -hmm. The place I went uh, to get my doctorate in early modern English literature used to offer, I think, 11 sections of Shakespeare a semester. Mm -hmm. And they, they're lucky if they can fill one. Agreed. Same thing at the university. You know, so this is this is not good. No. I and just, so we I, need to, we need to we need to go rogue. Yeah. And we need to take this out we, out of the hands of the mainstream. Yeah, I saw I saw a, a, a tweet from that doctor. You know, I'm not so sure. I still, you know, this Alex Berenson disagrees with Robert Malone on exactly what we have clinically known about ivermectin. Everybody knows it's pretty harmless, but um, that Robert Malone. He had a quote that was parallel polis the other day was on Twitter. We have to build alternative systems. We probably can't completely stop them or globalization, but we can choose not to buy their food, take their drugs or weird vaccines, and we can be in charge of our own health. We can be independent people in communities outside of their hellscape. Yeah. So people are coming along. <laughs> That's what this is part of. Yeah. Maybe maybe he's a, maybe he listens to the regeneration podcast. I'm sure he does. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for listening. You know, we're we'll, we're gonna see you next week at the regeneration podcast. And you can Take find care. us too on YouTube or over at Podbean, Spotify, and anywhere you really want to find us. And Have make sure to subscribe. To subscribe. That, they're growing. I think we're growing pretty well there.